Okay, um, good afternoon everybody and uh, thank you for having me in this panel. Uh, my presentation is um, uh, a short one, uh, knowing the interests of uh, our uh, participants in this webinar in terms of time. And the title of my presentation is uh, basically the road to green recovery in the Philippines. Is there life after COVID-19? Um, maybe just a very short introduction. Um, I am the chairperson of the Philippine Solar and Storage Alliance. This is the industry association which has been in existence for over seven years. And um, we are comprised of developers, uh, manufacturers, importers, installers, and EPC contractors, among others. So I would like to uh, start my uh, presentation by uh, giving you an update of where the Philippines is at in terms of solar deployment from 2005 to 2019. Uh, the 2005 is really an insignificant year because that was the year when the World Bank funded a trial of a utility scale. So the major installation uh, that uh, I would like to record will be in 2014. 2014 is an important year because just like in Vietnam, 2014 was when the feed-in tariff rules um, were issued by the government. Uh, the renewable energy uh, law was passed in 2008 and the implementing rules for the feed-in tariff was only um, uh, completed in uh, 2014. So this is the first big uh, jump in terms of solar installation, which is a uh, 22 megawatt. And as you can see, the end of the feed-in tariff was in 2016. So in a period of three years, you can almost see the phenomenal growth of the utility scale solar in the country. From 22, it reached uh, to 164 to 905. 905 was basically very close to one gigawatt and these were the installation as a result of the feeding tariff program. And as you can see, there was a lull from, there was only an increase of 25 megawatt from 2016 and an additional two megawatt in 2018. And there's a really a lull until 2019 in terms of the utility scale solar. But if you look at the solar rooftop, that has moved quite aggressively from almost three megawatt in 2016, it doubled and then it quadrupled. And then, that, so the, the growth is really more than exponential. So um, the, the story of solar in the Philippines is that at the beginning, the utility scale solar was driving that growth and after the feed-in tariff, there was a lull and the uh, solar rooftop uh, uh, space grew faster. And that is the reason why in a period of seven years from 2014, there was, we, you could almost see that we reached a gigawatt of installation uh, with the bigger portion of that, about 94% of that coming from the utility scale um, solar. And the growth of the rooftop solar is essentially because of the net metering regime that was introduced sometime in 2015. So the growth of solar, of solar in the country is really a result of government initiative in the Philippines. Now, there are other uh, provisions uh, in the Renewable Energy Act. Uh, after the, there is no more feed-in tariff in the Philippines, just like the experience of Vietnam. Uh, the tariff, uh, the impact, the rate impact of the tariff, uh, the incentive that was given um, has uh, generated a lot of controversy. And so since there are other provisions in the Renewable Energy Act, the government shifted to the Renewable Portfolio Standard where there are mandated participants like the utility companies and the retail electricity suppliers who are required to take a minimum percentage of their generation from renewable 
and currently it is set at 1% of the electricity sold. Okay, so that is really uh, something that uh, was, uh, that replaced the uh, feed-in tariff. Estimate will be about 600 megawatt per annum. That is 600 megawatt per year for the next 10 years. That is the conservative growth that is projected if the renewable portfolio standard is implemented uh, uh, and uh, uh, which is going to be next year. The other uh, policy initiative is the renewable energy market, which means that from the uh, megawatt uh, hour that will be dispatched, there is an equivalent energy electricity, uh, renewable energy certificates, which will be traded. So in a sense, this is again, another incentive that increases the value of clean energy. The last is the green energy option, which allows any generator to sell directly to anyone in the market uh, clean energy, but this is voluntary. So it is a non-regulated transaction. It is a bilateral transaction, meaning I can um, contract as much as five megawatt or even uh, 50 megawatt of my requirement from a retailer, which we call a uh, green energy retailer. Uh, uh, and I can contract with it without regulatory review. So that's why it is called a non-regulated transaction. So these are the, aside from the feed-in tariff, these are the four policy initiatives that are in place. Now, in January of this year, we had the first recorded case of the coronavirus. And two months after that, from one patient number one, we, in the reported cases increased to as much as 633 uh, cases. That triggered a lockdown in Metro Manila. Metro Manila is the epicenter of the COVID-19. And that's the reason why immediately when the reported cases really went up, we had a lockdown in March of 2020. And that lockdown stretched for four months and we only resumed partial activity in June of this year. Then we had a second lockdown uh, because our cases re were reaching as much as uh, 6,000 a day. So we had a second lockdown and that was in August 1st and that was lifted uh, where a partial resumption of activities start commenced in 15th of August. So we are still on partial quarantine uh, but in terms of the economy, the unemployment has already been recorded at 17% and our growth GDP dropped to 3.7. Uh, for the last seven years, we were, last seven years to eight years, we were growing at 6%. But because of this COVID-19, our, uh, our economies are, um, are uh, projecting a very low um, uh, growth uh, this year. 3.7 was the drop only in the first quarter. For the second quarter, we still have to wait for our economic uh, data to finalize the, the drop. So what happened during the, um, during the lockdown? I think the major, major uh, observation was basically the weakness of the grid in the Philippines. There was a widespread uh, experience of bill shocks because we were not digitized, because our network was not a digital network, the readers of the bill, of the meters, could not visit the consumers. So for four months, there was no reading of bill, but people were using electricity. There was no payment that was happening and there was no accurate reading of the bill. So what happened was that in June, the biggest utility companies just um, extrapolated. Uh, I should, th there was not a honest to goodness or a accurate reading. So this has caused a lot of consumers to complain and there were bill shocks 
and there were several payment disputes because of the erroneous and faulty reading of the meters. And uh, Meralco, which is the biggest, which um, uh, distributes power to 60% of the uh, consumers, had been asked by the regulators to explain the spike in their power bill. This has really been a problem to the consumer. And this really emerged as a major problem to the electricity sector. Now we're beginning to realize that we are, our network is not resilient. Our network is outdated and digitization has to happen. Second, while they were having bill shocks, those that have the rooftop solar were not paying basically Meralco the amount that they were charging because for homes that have solar rooftop, they were only paying less than a dollar a month, while the, those who were under the Meralco were being charged over $100. So you can see the disparity. And because of this situation, the, the users with solar are reinforced in their belief that their investment in the solar rooftop paid off. And for those who are thinking about solar, we are anticipating, as, as you can monitor in Facebook, that basically there is this strong push for more solar rooftop and more application on the net metering regime because of this particular dichotomy. On one side, you have Meralco, you have the utility, the biggest utility company experiencing I, um, disputes in payment and on the other side you see the solar rooftop owners enjoying the benefit of very close to a uh, you know marginal uh, marginal uh, charges in electricity uh, also during the lockdown the energy secretary signed uh, a circular okay uh, uh, announcing that the government will be holding auction. This is going to be an auction for clean energy. And the rules already, it was published in July of 29, uh, 29th of July. This was during the lockdown. And the rules defined who will, are the participants, meaning the utility companies and the electricity suppliers and all generators of renewable energy. So everybody are mandated to participate in the auction. And the auction can either be a supply only auction or an integrated supply and service contracting option. The pricing parameters were also announced. There is what we will call a green energy auction reserve. And I will explain that later. And the process of the auction was also uh, uh, discussed. So the pricing parameters, okay, okay, let me see. So the pricing parameters is that there will, the regulators will set a ceiling price. This is, this is to more or less manage the market. So the, uh, the um, uh, uh, regulators, no later than uh, May, will arrive at a maximum peso per kilowatt hour. And this will annually be set every May 31st. And the auction will happen every June for the next five years. So basically, every year there will be an auction in order to create the platform for buyers and sellers of electricity to participate in this market of clean energy and, and renewable energy certificates. So that is something that we will be looking forward to next year. And we are very optimistic that this will drive the solar deployment in the Philippines. Now, this is a diagram of how the auction process will look like. Uh, essentially, uh, it will start in May. And then uh, after 20, um, 
uh, after uh, almost uh, 60 days, uh, there will already be an execution of agreements. Now, if you look at the timeline in developing projects, securing an off-taker and getting the regulators to uh, approve the tariff takes a very long time. With, the, with this annual auction, that process is going to be cut to 60 days, 60 to 90 days, because it is already a pre-approved price by the regulator. Number two, it already conforms to a process that is approved by the regulator. And even the contracts will be approved by the regulator. It is the system is very much like our FIT system. And we have already experienced this. So we are expecting a very swift and very well organized auction. Now, because of this auction, we are basically uh, estimating to as much as uh, a, uh, by 2030, seven gigawatt. This is a very conservative number, seven gigawatt of utility scale and the rooftop will, will be about half a, uh, this is 430 megawatt, half a gigawatt. These are very conservative number because uh, um, the auction will essentially be a bilateral activity. Now, what we are expecting is that the floating solar will be a major player in the increase of the utility scale. Why? In the Philippines, there we have very narrow agricultural land. And what we are an archipelago, so we have numerous bodies of water. Look, the, the number of bays in our country are uh, very large. And we have also water reservoir. So all of this potential will drive the floating solar as a major major utility scale solar uh, in, the, in the Philippines. We also have our Laguna Lake, which is the third largest in Southeast Asia, and with Indonesia and Cambodia as having the first two top. And the Laguna Lake uh, um, uh, area, there are already nine companies in the lake with existing service contracts issued by the government. Four companies have already ongoing pilot projects in the lake. Last January, the board resolution of the government, the, the, the authority handling the lake, has already declared the lake as open for commercial uh, floating solar. And the rules for lease application is currently being drafted. We are expecting that in quarter one next year, the lease agreement will be signed. And our estimate for the nine companies that have already existing contracts is at 4.5 uh, 4 gigawatt. There will be a nine gigawatt allocation, which is 10% of the lake, which is a very conservative number until uh, the, for the next five years. The 4.5 gigawatt is only for the next three years because that will be uh, this year and uh, uh, that will be for 2021 and 2022 and 2023. The, this administration ends their term in the middle of 2022. So uh, we are expecting that there will be a carryover until the new administration is elected and assume office in 2023. So in terms of the dam, this is, a, uh, this is already the, the biggest dam. It's called Pantabangan Dam. It is in the Central Plains. There are already, again, a uh, pilot. This is a 200 kilowatt pilot that is already being um, uh, undertaken and conducted. And there are three companies that have been given a pilot status by the National Irrigation Administration. And the potential of the floating solar there is two gigawatt. So you can see from the lake and from the dam, from one dam only, we can already expect 11 gigawatt of new installation. So to summarize, basically, the floating solar will offer the solution to the long land conversion process. 
So this will really remove the barrier to the land conversion and will drive the growth of utility scale solar. In addition, the yearly auction will lessen the rock regulatory review, as I said. The implementation of the renewable portfolio standard will drive the market and the other policies encouraging deployment of renewables, such as the green energy option and renewable energy will be rolled out uh, in the next months. So we are pushing the government to recognize solar as the stimulus for economic recovery. We are expecting that if these installations happen, about $1.2 billion of new investment are expected to flow into the system. Um, second, there will be 153 new construction jobs that will be available close to the dam and close to the lake. And finally, consumer spending will increase as employment begins to happen and as investments begin to flow. So we are um, optimistic. So I hope that uh, you will see the Philippines as a promising market for solar in the next three to five years. Thank you.